Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Judah Miller. Now, Judah Miller uh, has worked on a bunch of shows that you know and love. King of the Hill, American Dad, uh, the HBO series Crashing. Um, but his new project uh, is pretty exciting. So it's it's called Bupkiss. It's on Peacock TV. Uh, it stars Pete Davidson playing kind of a uh, a comic version of Pete Davidson, already a pretty common figure. But it's it's about his life and uh, you know the the vagaries of being a star in the age of social media and all that stuff. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun. It's really interesting uh, and it's really interestingly structured. I'm excited to talk to him about how the the show came together in terms of uh, what they are doing with tone and playing with that sort of stuff. Um, uh, but uh, again, uh, really excited to have Judah on. Uh, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I, I, my first question is for you. I want to know what Bulwark Goes to Hollywood means. Uh, well, I work at a, a publication called The Bulwark, uh, and we, we're based in D.C. I actually live in Dallas, but we're based okay. in D.C., so it's like I'm going to Hollywood I to see. talk to people. Okay. About the, about the business of Hollywood. It's a business of showbiz show. It's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so since it's a business of show, uh, showbiz show, let me, let me jump right to a business of showbiz question. Um, one of the things I found uh, kind of interesting about uh, Bupkis is that you are, uh, you're, it's, it's premiering on Peacock in a um, binge style strategy, right? It's coming out all eight episodes at once, which is different for you. Uh, am I am I right? Am I, it I, is. I, looking at your bio, it looks like a lot of weekly uh, stuff. It, did that change how you guys were making the show or uh, writing it and creating it, or is it is it just like, well, this is how we're doing it? Yeah, you know, it didn't influence the way that we made the show. I, like, we didn't really know that that's how it was going to get released when we were writing this. But um, but I mean, I'm excited that people are able to do that. Like I'm enjoying binging shows that are released this way. Uh, it's just a little for me, it feels a little weird because we worked on this so hard for so long. And then the concept <laughs> that someone might consume this in like a day or two and then move on is a little disheartening. But I but I'm also just happy for people to enjoy this in any way that they want to enjoy this. And, you know, I think binging something can be really fun too but that being said like we definitely didn't um craft this to you know lay it out in a way that encouraged people to binge yeah i mean it, it's it's interesting i a friend of mine uh who uh works on or used to work on community chris mckenna he says hi i love chris um, mckenna he's the best <laughs> He uh, he he talked about uh, when i when i talked to him uh, on the show he talked about uh the um the way that they used to be able to follow reactions to community as it was kind of coming out in real time, they would, they'd watch it and they'd, uh, they'd be able to kind of not, not necessarily craft storylines, but see what was working, see what wasn't. It was like a real time um, Twitter is real time sounding board. Uh, I mean, have you, have you used that on your shows in the past? I mean, obviously it's not a thing that really works um, in animation as much because, you know, everything yeah. is done uh a year ahead of time almost um or 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 on hbo or here but i mean i'm curious if that's a that's a thing that you would do as yeah. well yeah <laughs> i'd like to say that i have but i don't i don't actually have a memory of like tuning a show towards an audience's appetite um you know i think that like from my experience it's always like you have like a sense in the room and like who you're creating with of like what interests you the most. But, um, but yeah, I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's a, that's a pretty, that's a pretty good thing to like, to be able to like in real time, like calibrate your show. Uh, I, that seems like, like for community, that's like, I could see how that, that maybe like factored in and like that's part of what made that show so kind of fun and interesting. But yeah. I'm not here to talk about community. I'm here to no, talk no, no. about Bubkiss. No, absolutely not. Let's talk about Bubkiss. So <laughs> I, I was I was trying to describe Bubkiss to a friend uh, who who's excited to watch the show because he he's a big Pete Davidson fan. He's like, what? How would you describe it? And I was like, well, it's it's kind of like it's a little bit like uh curb your enthusiasm but a little a little more surreal than that in places um but not also not really like that it's it's more of a almost a standard sitcom but not really that either how would you describe it I, 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 he, yeah it's it's i love that it's hard to describe like somebody the biggest compliment i feel like i got on this was a friend of mine watched the pilot and said that 
they felt like they'd never seen something like this before. And I was like, man, that's incredible in this world where there's so many amazing shows and so many things have been done to have anything that feels like remotely fresh in this, in this oversaturated world that we live in is feels like a huge accomplishment, but I would describe Bupkis as a fever, absurd fever dream of what it feels like to be in Pete Davidson's orbit, you know, and when we were first started, mapping out like wanting to develop this show you know we we realized that there was no concept that we could come up with that would rival the comedy that comes from just being around pete because he seems to have like an endlessly absurd and uh escalating uh life (laughs) and it's like i don't think that there's any like concept or fictitious situation that we could come up with that would be as fun or fu- or ripe for comedy as Pete's actual uh, day-to-day existence. And that, that kind of plays into the show. I mean, he's literally Googling himself, driving himself crazy. Yeah. Uh, while is, is, is that, is that what he does in real life? Does he sit there and obsess? Like no, I mean, Pete, a- Pete actually has like a very like healthy, like he, he has a flip phone right now. So Pete doesn't like have the ability. He's like off social media. So he's like, not, he, it's it's actually like, I, I find it very aspirational. Like, like the, to live in a world where you're not able to look anything up at any time on your phone. Um, but, uh, but you know, like there is like a huge uh, disconnect between Pete's public persona and uh, the way that people that actually know Pete and are close with Pete and how his friends view him. So that was like a very uh, big theme that we we're interested in exploring this first season on Bupkis. And I, I think it's kind of relatable to a lot of people because people have these kind of public personas that they portray through technology that's not always exactly the same as their personal lives. Yeah. I mean, is there, was there any worry while you guys were uh, writing this about playing into some of those um, preconceptions of, of Pete and, and, and playing them up or, 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 you know, there's a disclaimer at the start of every episode that says, this is not, you know, these are based on some real people, but it's fictional and there's dramatic stuff. I assume Ray yeah, that's Romano Stacey doesn't. Keech. That's Stacy yeah. Keats doing it's, that. It's such, oh, that is yeah. sta- okay. Yeah. It was it's yeah. such a great voice. I was trying to yeah, it was cool. <laughs> uh, place it. Uh, what, so, any was there any concern uh, there, just in terms of um, you know how his perception plays in the real world and and amping that up? Or uh, I mean, you know, Pete is someone that is very fearless in his comedy. I think that's what fans of Pete appreciate about him is that there's like a unfiltered kind of authenticity to who he is. And, uh, you know, he really wanted to write this show fearlessly. And uh, it's, uh, it's always incredible to collaborate and be creative with someone that is that open to explore intimate aspects of their lives to satirize, you know, uh, thoughts about who he is, even if it's not true he's he's just totally fearless to to do anything i think he that comes across that sense of anarchy to do anything and allow the show to do and be anything without concern for what people might take away from it is part of what makes this show so special uh you mentioned stacy keach and that's just like i mean again it, like i it was it was a voice i recognized couldn't quite place uh and is is perfect but this the show has I, I mean, I could I could list 20 names, uh, oh, yeah. 20 bold face names just as, uh, you know, quick guest shots. Uh, Ray Romano, Charlie Day, uh, all sorts of people. Of course, Joe Pesci is in this. Like, the know, great Bobby Joe Pesci. Cannavale. Bobby Cannavale. Bobby Falco. I mean, it's just it's it's amazing. How how did you guys how did you wrangle such a good cast? I, you know what it's it's I give it it's purely Pete. I mean, like Pete has you know he's a dreamer. He has big uh, expectations about who he would like to cast. And you know, you say you want to have Joe, have Joe Pesci come out of retirement to play his grandfather on this Peacock series, and people say it's impossible. And then uh, the next thing you know, we're meeting with Joe Pesci and having serious conversations about having him join our series. Um, it's uh, I think a lot of it is. You know, a lot. Of, some of it is people that Pete knows. Between Pete and Lauren Michaels, there's an extremely big reach that we can go for some very like 
amazing talent, but there's also, I think people responded to the material people, uh, Joe and Pete formed like a real type of almost like grandfatherly type of relationship with Pete to mentor him. That was incredible that to witness during the production of the show that even exceeds like what you see in the series. I think Pete and Joe actually have a lot in common and really connected. And, and that's, and I think, I think how we were able to do the impossible and, and <laughs> get him to be a part of this show, but it really is a surreal feeling. And it's like very humbling, you know, as a writer to, you know, have people like Brad Garrett and Edie Falco and Ray Romano elevate what we're doing and, and add such nuance to, to sometimes some really absurd things that we put into the show. Well, I, can you could you highlight an example of something that uh, that uh, one of them brought to the 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 show that you weren't expecting? Something you know uh, that was was kind of surprising. I like I, I will say when I was watching the one the performance that jumped out at me the most was Ray Romano, just uh, as as the um, I, well, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but uh, a, a it's like a, seeing Ray in a way off, that you've never seen comedian. him. Yeah, it's like it's a different like it's a different shade of Ray <laughs> you know, what you've seen, but it's like, and, and again, like it's like to be for him to sort of fearlessly trust that we were doing something that wasn't just insane was uh, incredible, you know? Um, but I, I guess like to me, the big, the most surprising contribution to the show is like Joe Pesci's take on this character. You know, he is such a tough, character and he's so um you know unwilling to placate pete in any way and and challenging of pete in a way that was i think harder than we necessarily initially envisioned it but it provided so much to the show and he is such a sense of love and support and mentorship of pete that comes through despite being so critical of pete um but i mean like you know Someone like Joe Pesci is, uh, he's such an iconic uh, performer and he, he challenges the scripts and challenges us as much as he's, his character is challenging Pete. So it's like he really, uh, he really had a huge impact on the show creatively. Yeah. I mean, you really uh, get that sense of grandfatherly disappointment at times, which is, I mean, it's a, I mean, Joe Pesci, great actor. You can't. Uh, but I mean, it's, one of the best amazing. actors. Yeah, it's like it's like you just want to like you don't want to you want to do right by him as you do with all these actors. But like, you know, and he's he's kind of he's inspecting and looking into every inch of every line, you know, and, and finding the continuity of character there. And it's and then when you layer in that our show takes absurdist turns that bends things it's very complicated you know where your lines are but it's like but we were able to find that i think with him but man like the the level of uh depth and emotional poignancy that we're getting from people like Edie falco and joe pesci and brad garrett is just incredible yeah Bobby uh, Cannavale I mean like it's it's insane yeah, yeah. I Cannavale is great in this and everything I mean I get again the cast here is just stacked I want to I want to highlight one one actor who um uh maybe maybe some folks aren't but Simon Rex Simon Simon Rex's episode as a as a uh crispy as a, crispy. I, a <laughs> Florida Florida uh, diamond dealer slash party goer slash whatever it's a, he's a, a he'd be self-described hot boy <laughs> hot boy style is how he would say it. but uh but, but he's yeah, he's fantastic i mean i you know he's such he a good actor yeah i mean like he's like again like one of those he's uh someone that pete knows and so we were able to get him to come in and like yeah i mean like it's like you watch you know red rocket and you're like that man this guy's amazing actor and uh to have him come in and and play such a heightened like absurd persona and bring such a kind of odd level of nuance to to something that's so kind of big too um it's just amazing it was like it each of our episodes has its own kind of distinct vibe and like you know it's like what simon rex brings to that episode is like unlike any of our other episodes in a way so it's like we like that the show 
continually keeps kind of shifting in tone and 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 that's i think that's one of the benefits of getting someone like simon rex to come in and, and play a character like that yeah i think that's is that the fourth episode of the the that's the, the fourth episode fourth yeah episode. i, I yeah. will say for me personally that's where the whole show kind of clicks because it is it's very different in vibe it's very mm-hmm. different in style and it's like okay i kind i see what they're doing here they're going for um, something a little different each each time out, and it works. Uh, it works. Um, the, let me let me talk about writing then. So you know, how did you guys write this show? Was it, did you sit down with Pete and you were like, well, what do we what do we want to what do you want to tell? What story do you want to tell? Or is it did you sit down and map out like a here's where we how we get from point A to uh, point B uh, at the end of the the season? Yeah, I mean, like it's a little bit of both, but it's like all the episodes would originate from Pete. You know talking about different aspects of Pete's life that we were interested in exploring and then looking at like the way that those separate kind of standalone episodes fit within a larger arc for his character over the course of a season. But in a way we kind of embraced a very erratic nature of storytelling because it's like, we didn't want it to be overly mapped out or beautifully designed. Like I think that like the idea that we're, like I, the idea that no one might expect that our second episode is going to take the turn that it takes off of the pilot was something that we embraced, but it was really that like, I don't know if you even know if you've seen that episode or not, but like it, it, um, it informed so it gave so much context to Pete in his adult life and the, and the dynamic that he has with his mom and his grandfather. It, it seemed to like, is that we view that very much as an origin story for his character. So it like, it felt important to us that that happened at the early part of the season. Um, and then, yeah, I think that like, once you get into the latter part of the season, there's like an incredible thrust into our finale, but, um, but it's like, like every show, like you, you know, you break episodes that, you know, sometimes you'll break an episode, with the arc, the overall season arc in mind. And sometimes you just have an idea for an episode that it, that plays to a character and then you just find where it fits within that arc. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for the record, I, I have watched, I've watched all the episodes now. Uh, I binged them uh, because I'm at home with COVID locked in my bedroom. Oh man. Uh, it was very easy. It was very That's just good. to get, get through them all. Uh, but uh, so I, I watched it as I think a lot of people probably will, which is, kind of all at once. Um, and I, I think it's I think it's good for the show, too, because I do think, uh, like I said, it, 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 it once you kind of realize what's happening and get into the rhythm of it, it works. I think it works better as a um, like the like, the, a, like the, the variety of episodes. Yeah. Like, sort of get with the flow yeah. of the uh, choppy waters of those. Yeah. Shows. <laughs> Uh, uh, choppy waters makes it sound bad. It's not. No, I know. It's, it's not good. choppy waters. It's, 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 it's smooth you know, sailing. It's, it's the smooth sailing of the show. S- um, you know, you hit the peaks and sw- swells. To sw- I don't know. I don't. I'm not a boater. No, I, um, I honestly like. I, it's it's been very gratifying to talk to people that have seen the show and like have people respond so effusively to the shifting tone because it's one of those things where you go like, I don't know if people are like if people like something to be of one tone, but like this is so erratic and constantly shifting, but it's nice to see that people get it and, and still appreciate it, even though it is always changing. Uh, so the, the, the show is very concerned with uh, Pete's personal life. Of course, this fictionalized version of his personal life, but also I, you know, I assume a, a fictionalized version of his professional life as well. And yeah. uh, one of there's a, there's a great, there's a great episode where he goes up to Canada, just setting the, the stage here for listeners. He goes up to Canada to shoot, uh, uh, some footage for a Brad Pitt movie. Um, mm-hmm. and w- I, I won't spoil it, but it's, it's, uh, it is one of the, um, one of the weirder aspects of modern filmmaking where he is on a soundstage with a director on an iPad, kind of telling him what to do remotely and a, an AD. And there's, it just is, is, is such a weird way to think about the filming of a, of a film. Yeah, um, for people. I mean, I, I'm I'm curious if you've gotten any response from people who don't understand that this is how a lot of these movies, movies are, are made, made now. now. Yeah, I mean, like I I'm proud of that episode because I feel like it captures the isolation. Um, and Pete is sort of like 
almost like in some parts, like he gets treated almost like a object. Like it's like that sort of floating between different spaces. And, uh, you know, I think that like, there's a glamorous idea of what it might be like to be a, in a movie, but then there's the reality of what it actually is like, you know, for Pete to go to Canada during the holidays and be isolated like that. Um, it's, you know, it's very different than what the outside perspective might be. And I think it plays into that major theme that we are exploring the whole season, which is the disparity between the public image and persona of who Pete Davidson and what his life is like and the reality of, of what it is. Uh, there's a great musical cue in that episode as well uh, from uh, mm -hmm. Requiem for a Dream. Uh, is that it, I, I'm just curious if there was any like trouble getting the rights to that or, they, or was that just uh, we're, we're using this? For, you know, it's funny because I think that the one that, that you might have seen a cut that had some. Oh, some temp like, so it's yeah, track. Yeah. But I mean, okay, like, never that Requiem that. music is like unbelievable. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. an amazing score. Uh, never, never mind then. Um, uh, the uh, the one the one big uh, the one big cameo that uh, I, I wasn't going to spoil, but then I saw it in the trailer, so I guess I can. Um, uh, is Art the Clown? Art the, how did how is is Pete Davidson a big uh, Terrifier fan? Was that Pete, how did that? Pete come is about? a big Terrifier fan, and he introduced me to the Terrifier franchise. And it is, I, it's again, like I described the show as a absurd fever dream of what it's like to be in Pete's life. And like, there's nothing more fever dream like than going to work and, and having Art the Clown be there. And <laughs> we're standing by a trailer and having a conversation with Art the Clown in full makeup. Um, but it's like, yeah, it, it was uh, this, this, so much of the casting and so many elements of this show are a collection of Pete's like favorite actors, they were involved in some of his favorite projects. It's like a, it's like a collection of just all of his favorite things. And so I think to like have art, the clown be a part of this show and this world is, uh, is like the part of the fever dream of, of Pete Davidson. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was, that was uh Pete's a big fan and, uh, and he just, he reached out and, and <laughs> next thing you know, we got Art the Clown scaring everyone on set. I'm just glad that uh, Pete Davidson is in the Terrifier universe now, officially in the Terrifier cinematic universe. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I always like to close uh, these episodes, these shows by asking if there's anything I should have asked. If you think there's anything people should know about the show, about the, the making of the show, uh, what's going on in the business of Hollywood right now, uh, anything, anything at all. Man, I just like, I just am so excited for people to come and see the show and, and hopefully be surprised by the show doing and being things that maybe they might not expect it to be. Um, like I, I really, uh, I'm, we're just all so proud of like what we've made and the hard work we've put into it. And, uh, and we're excited for people to binge it in a day or two and then move on in their lives. <laughs> well, do you, is, do you think, um, uh, what are what are the hopes for season number two? I mean, I assume you guys hope for for a second uh, season here, or or maybe not. Is this a one and done? What do you think? Oh, I mean, I, I definitely hope that for a season two because we just have so much fun making this together. But like right now, we've been so focused on season one that we're just really excited for people to see season one and and yeah. hopefully enjoy it enough that we can that we get to make more. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for being on the show, Judah. I really appreciate it. Thank um, you. My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm culture editor at The Bulwark, uh, and I'll be back next week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. We'll see you guys then. You loved Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. What you did not see is... When Raquel arrives and she wants to talk to me, I made her sit in a corner. Explain. <laughs> sat in a corner booth all by herself in the dark. Waiting for, to talk to you. Waiting for me to finish dancing to 50 Cent. It's my birthday. <laughs> sit in a corner. Give them Lala wherever you listen.